you find it hard to sleep tonight, resting by the Christmas lights? Could there be something you forgot? Beyond the bows and mistletoe, the tree with presents wrapped below, there's more to this than you had ever thought. Have we lost the reason that we celebrate each year? What is Christmas? If there never was a Savior wrapped in a manger, what is Christmas without Christ? Remember how the story goes, God's gift was wrapped in swaddling clothes. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I love Christmas just as much as you do, and I love it because of Jesus Christ, for he said, I am the light of the world. And I get the privilege of reading to you Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you, for behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. The nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Amen. Second chance inside. 
remembers that same old life. Keep all your pain inside, cause no one will understand the last thing this lost world needs. Someone I'm trying.
town so that God can chase them down there along with their leaders.
be seated. Good morning. Thank you, worship team, for leading us to sing what Pastor Joey is probably going to share, what God has placed on his heart. And as Chris read from Isaiah, uh, you may be experiencing a lot of darkness right now in your life, things that are going on. But his light is going to be shining upon you. His glory rests upon you. And that's what makes these candles so beautiful. It's the darkness. And that's why we light the Advent candles. So let's see what the Word of the Lord has to say about the light that we celebrate. In John chapter 8, verse 12. Again, therefore Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. Also in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp and put it under the peck measure, but they put it on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Amen. Thank you so much, Jim and Chris, for our scripture readings this morning. All right, I'm going to play a little game. You guys ready? Oh, okay, cool, awesome. Sorry, I, I was an old youth and kids pastor, so, you know, we just, we got to be in it. Um, <clears throat> all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give movie quotes, and my wife just absolutely pleaded with me from the bottom of her heart not to, like, impersonate people or to do their voices, but I have to. Um, I'm so bad, like, with accents, and I could never be an actor, even though I can make myself cry pretty easily, but... Um, uh, but I got some movie quotes, um, and if you don't understand 75% of these, we just need to work on our friendship. Um, <laughs> all right, you guys ready? Feel free to shout it out. Bonus points if you can get the year that this movie was released. Y'all ready? All right. <clears throat> Please, sir, I want some more. Hey, awesome. Hey, we're off to a great start. What year? <laughs> It is. Uh, 1968. 1968. Okay, this is a, oh, obviously. Um, This is super new, so I understand. Um, This is the way. Mandalorian! Mandalorian! 2019. Nice work, nice work. Yeah, bonus Christian points. No, just joking. Um, Freedom! Braveheart. 1995, that was the best year for movies. Yo, Adrian, I did it! Rocky, what Rocky? Now, 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 Rocky, uh, to be fair, he said, yo, Adrian, about 50 million times. Um, But the, the classic end of the movie, he just defeated Apollos. I did it! Anyway, beautiful. Was it Apollos? I think so. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Star Wars. Star Wars. What episode? Now, now I'm really going to expose some nerds here. Uh, the first one, yeah, what you actually mean is... Number four, my lord. Oh, that's not a movie quote. Oh, we should have done that. We just watched Shrek. Uh, not <laughs> I love it. I love it. He's like, number, number three, my lord. Anyway, so good. Um, Awesome. Okay. Now, this is also kind of a newer one. You is kind. You is smart. You is important. The help. Oh, yeah. 2011. Beautiful movie. Just keep swimming. Nemo. Nemo. 2003. I'll be back. Terminator. What year? You guys know? 
Now, this one's super controversial. I'm not about to swear, like, back off, guys. No, I'm sorry. This one's super controversial because we don't know what specific word uh, is said here, but if you build it, they will come. Field of dreams. Now, it's controversial because a lot of people think that it says that whisper, right? If you build it, he will come. So people are divided. Okay, that was about as scandalous as I'm going to be this morning, right? Life is like a box of chocolates. Forrest Gump. 1994. Oh, I love this one. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. Back to the future. 1985. To infinity and beyond. Toy Story. What year? 1995. How was this 1995? Like, it, my kids watch this all the time. It is a timeless classic. Oh, one of my favorite movies of all time. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. <laughs> Princess Bride, 1987. Good year, good year, good year. I wasn't even born then. That aged me. Uh, classic. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz. What year? Who said 38? Super close. 1939. At least, at least released. It was obviously worked on prior. Uh, this one is a classic meme, even a remix. They're taking the hobbits to Isengard. Isengard. Go, 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 go. Sorry. What's that? For, for, <laughs> uh, Lord of the Rings, Two Towers. What year? I am amazed by you. <laughs> 2002. All right. Hey, welcome to church. Welcome to church. Some of you are like, I don't know what's happening here. Talked about the Holy Spirit. Now it's movie quotes. <laughs> I love these words because these words instantly light up your imagination, instantly lights up your imagination and transport you, transports you to a specific story or script or a narrative. Like these words like unlock a memory bank in you. They're hyperlinks to a movie that you've watched. This is exactly John's intent with the opening lines of his gospel. We just said movie quotes, and instantly it's like, oh, I know that movie. And you probably, in just a blink of an eye, you had all this movie go through your head. This is what John did in his prologue. And let's look at his prologue from the perspective of the Jewish people. As I just said a movie quote, and my man Brian not only tells me the movie, but the year. So it is, and even more so, with the phrase, in the beginning. John's opening words of his telling of the gospel. In the beginning is a loaded phrase. It's the first words found in the Bible. It's the opening line from which the Jews have grounded their worldview on for thousands of years. It's the opening line to their story of creation and slavery, deliverance, prosperity, and exile. And these are the words they would have recited in the temple since childhood. It's arguably the most distinct phrase in the whole of the Hebrew language, and John just opened with it. Snap. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. See, even the language about the power of God's word was oh so familiar to the Jewish people. For example, Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. What's interesting is that the Aramaic word for the word, word, that was a lot of words in one sentence, is memra. Memra means God's creative or directive word powerfully manifesting in the world. 
Aramaic. What's interesting is when Aramaic became a primary language among the Jews, they developed interpretive translations of the Hebrew Bible in Aramaic, and these interpretive translations were called Targums. And in Targum Neophyte, or in Genesis 1, 1 through 5, this is how it reads. From the beginning, with wisdom, the word of the Lord created and perfected the heavens and the earth. And the earth was waste and unformed, desolate of man and beast, empty of plant cultivation and of trees. And darkness was spread over the face of the abyss, and a spirit of mercy from before the Lord was blowing over the surface of the waters. And the word of the Lord said, let there be light. And there was light according to the decree of his word. And it was manifest before the Lord that the light was good, and the word of the Lord separated the light from the darkness, and the word of the Lord called the the light daytime, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, and the order of the work of creation on the first day. Every Jew who picked up John's biography of Jesus would have read the words, in the beginning was the word, and thought to themselves, He's telling our story. Now from the perspective of the Greek. That word, word, and the opening line of John's prologue, his telling of the gospel, was logos. Because the New Testament was written in Greek, so the Greek word for word is logos. To the Greek, logos was the foundational term of Stoic philosophy. It was the core, the very essence that made rational sense of the world. Logos was the divine principle that made existence possible. Oh, how it would have caught the attention and imagination of a Greek when he or she read the words, in the beginning was the logos. They would have picked up John's biography of Jesus, and just based on the opening line, they would have thought to themselves, He's telling our story. With just a few inspired strokes of the pen, John reached two completely different audiences with two opposite worldviews and weaved them together in the same narrative. He took the pinnacle of Greek philosophical thought and placed it within the Hebrew Torah to make the most substantial claim for the very foundation of our existence, that the Lagos was with the Theos, And the Lagos is the Theos. He's telling the whole Greek population and audience that's reading his gospel that it actually isn't a principle that upholds the whole world. It's a person. It's Jesus. John is offering good news to Jews and Greeks, to zealots and Stoics, to Pharisees and philosophers, To prolific professors and illiterate peasants, what is this good news? That the power of God, the Lagos, the Memra, the hope of man, the person of Jesus has come in the flesh. This Memra, this Lagos, this word, as John wrote later in verse 14, this word became flesh and dwelt among us. A Greek word for dwelt literally means to tent, to tabernacle. John is saying that this word who upholds the holy universe has moved into the neighborhood. He's become a person. He's lived among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Wow. You got to admit John's pretty good. (laughs) Jesus has come. Picking up again in verses 3 through 5 as we go through the text this morning in John 1. And I'm not going to hit on every verse, but I just want to highlight a few in our short time together. And please, from this place, reread John 1. Verses 3 through 5, it says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was a life, and the life was the light of men. 
the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. With the phrase in the beginning, and descriptions like word, life, light, darkness, it's obvious that John's prologue is meant to run parallel with the creation account. Why? Because just like the cosmic event of creation, John is giving account of another cosmic event. It's when the creator has stepped into and is beginning to redeem his creation. God bless you. The source and sustainer of life, just think with me about this for a second. The source and sustainer of all life became a helpless, dependent infant. The one who breathed on the chaos to bring order also gasped for breath in between newborn screams. The one who is light, who declared let there be light was born in the silence and obscurity of the night. The one who spoke creation into existence also babbled as a baby. The one who hand made man was held in the hands of man. The one who effortlessly upholds the universe experienced fatigue hunger, and thirst. The one who assigned jobs to the sun, moon, and stars walked along the sea, humbly inviting people by saying, follow me. But Jesus, the light of the world, as soon as he came into the world he created, he experienced an ongoing, hostile, and dark opposition. Herod tried to slaughter the newborn Jesus, but darkness didn't win. Demons tried to stand against the advancement of the kingdom, but darkness didn't win. The Pharisees tried to plot, trap, and end Jesus, but darkness did not win. The Romans even crucified Jesus, but as Jesus hung lifeless on a cross, still the darkness did not win. The grave, the stone, and the guards tried to keep Jesus down, but death could not hold him, and darkness could not win. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The arrival of Jesus means that the light and reality of the world to come is already shining in the midst of this dark world. The arrival of Jesus means that God isn't preoccupied with a different world while ignoring this one. Rather, God is building a new world right here within the current one through the redeemed. The arrival of Jesus means that he is planting new creation seeds within the infested soil and among the weeds of old creation. This means that no matter the dark and difficult situation you may find yourself in, the darkness will not prevail. The darkness will not triumph. The darkness will not win. The darkness will not have the final say. For the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This isn't a mere metaphor. This isn't wishful thinking. This is reality, and it's a promise. Whatever you are going through, whatever you have gone through, whatever you will go through, the light of Jesus, despite evil's best attempts, still shines today. The dawn of the new day is upon us. The star 
is here, the sun is rising. The incarnation of Christ is the promise that the day is almost here and the night is passing. Verses 9 through 12. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. See, the world and his people didn't recognize or receive him Because Jesus didn't meet people's vision and expectation of what a Messiah, what a king should look like. Jesus wasn't born in a palace. He was placed in a manger. He wasn't raised in a wealthy and powerful family, but in a lower social and economic class as the son of a carpenter. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve He didn't show bias towards the mighty, but he befriended the lowly, the sinful, the broken, the ostracized, and the marginalized. His mission wasn't to overthrow Rome, but to expose and overthrow the spiritual and systemic corruption that was killing his image bearers. His entry into Jerusalem wasn't on a war horse. He was on a donkey, the symbol of peace. His crown wasn't made of gold, it was made of thorns. His exaltation didn't take place in a a throne room, but on a cross. Dorothy Sayers once wrote, for whatever reason, God chose to make man as he is, limited, suffering, and subject to sorrows and death. He had the honesty and the courage to take his own medicine. Whatever game he is playing with creation, he has kept his own rules and played fair. He can exact nothing from man that he has not exacted from himself. He has himself gone through the whole of human experience, from the trivial irritations of family life, the cramping restrictions of hard work and lack of money, to the worst horrors of pain, humiliation, defeat, despair, and death. When he was a man, he played the man. He was born in poverty and died in disgrace and thought it well worthwhile. Now, some of the phrase here I get isn't the most palatable, but I really appreciate how she expressed this. The arrival of Jesus reveals a God who may not offer escape from all of our pain, but promises to walk with us through the pain. Jesus reveals a God who may not take away all of our suffering right now, but a God who personally took our sin and suffering and still wears the scars of it today. Our God who came in flesh, died and when he rose, glorified, triumphant, and victorious, he rose with a wound in his side, hands with holes and feet with holes. He wears the scars of our pain and plight today in heaven. He may not take away all of the pain and suffering, but he wears the scars. He walks through the pain with you. He is the God who is called Emmanuel, God with us, which means he does not leave us nor forsake us. And that even the powers of evil cannot separate his love for you. (laughs) 
Where's Sandy when you need her? She usually comes up with tissues. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Actually, Bill DeGroote gave me my own handkerchief so I could put in my, in my back pocket. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm shaken up a little bit right now because I know some of you, you're experiencing a lot of pain and a lot of grief. And I think it's so easy this time of year to put on our holly jolly, you know, church going, Christmas celebrating face on. But one thing that you are always invited to when it comes to Laurel Church is you are invited to come as you are. If it's your best day or if it's your absolute worst, bottom of the pit, rock bottom day. We love you. And Jesus is with you there. Verse 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Even though many of the powerful and the prominent and the prosperous didn't recognize or receive Jesus, for the most part, who did? It was the lowly. It was the last. It was the least. It was the lost. The one who stretched out his hand to create Adam from the dirt is the same one who stretched out his hand to heal a leper from his disease. The eyes who searched for the ashamed Adam and Eve in the garden are the same eyes who looked upon and redeemed the ashamed Samaritan woman at the well. The one who spoke creation into existence is the same one who did not speak to defend himself when unjustly arrested and accused so that he could die, making it possible for me to live. The one who hung the stars where they are and said, it is good, is the same one who hung on a cross and said, Father, forgive them, and it is finished. Our creator became our recreator. Our designer became our redeemer. Our sustainer, who is life and who upholds life, became the savior who gives new life. The son of God became the son of man so that the ostracized could be welcomed, so that the orphan could be adopted so that the lonely would never be alone, so that the hiding and the ashamed could be seen and redeemed, so that the one carrying the crushing burden of sin could have their sin be replaced with a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. The one who is weak and powerless could be born again and given the authority of being God's child. And for the one who is condemned to die so that they could receive life that is abundant and eternal. Just remember, it is the one whose speech creates, who says over you and who says over me, welcomed, forgiven, redeemed mine. And when Jesus says this over you, he's not just speaking a sentiment to you. He's speaking new creation reality over you and within you. For he is the same one whose speech creates, and if he says your identity over you and within you, he speaks new creation reality who he says you are, 
is who you are. He is our creator and recreator. Worship team, you can come on up. And Brett, if you want to, if you want to hit that switch real quick for the lights. For the lights in the back. Thanks, bro, bro. I just called you bro, bro. Sorry. Okay, I didn't know if that one had a wick. I'm the most untraditional person ever, so I don't even know what candle to light right now. I know it's not the pink one. Right? Okay, let's just go with this one. Is that good? Do I have your approval? Uh, hey, actually, could you kill all these lights too? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Whatever feeling of hopelessness you may have, there's hope. Whatever feeling of condemnation you may have, there's forgiveness. Whatever feeling of regret you may carry, there's grace. However, the amount of pain it is that you feel, there's healing. Even of life feels and seems dark. The light of Christ has come. The new day is dawning. The darkness has not overcome it. To the chair in front of you, in the back of that chair is communion. Let's take communion together this, in this moment. The lights can go back on in the stage. Worship team's coming up. But let's take communion. You gotta peel away two layers, the top layers for what we call bread. The bottom is to peel, to drink the juice. Let's just take it together real quick. As we said last week in 1 John, John wrote about the one who has come, who they have seen, who they have touched, who they have embraced, the one that they have fellowship with. And Jesus left us these sacraments, these elements. He left us what symbolizes his body and his blood. So that just as real as the incarnation is, that Jesus is man as well. And that one day we get to see him face to face. That one day he's coming in. I know he's coming in and giving us a big bear hug. That we will embrace the one we love. So we look forward to that day by embracing and actually physically touching elements that resemble his body and blood. We hold elements that resemble and symbolize the body that he still wears today, that
that has the scars of our sin and suffering. The one who paved a way for unbroken relationship with us and the Father. So let's take of the bread, eat and remember the body of Jesus that was broken for our wholeness. Remember how John put it in John 1, 13? Uh, for those who did receive him, he gave the, the right and the authority to become children of God who are born not of flesh, not of blood, nor of the will of man, but of God. We are not born again into his family by our blood, but by his, <laughs> by grace, and through faith in his grace. So let's drink and remember the grace that was poured out for us. We're going to play another Christmas song. Again, feel free to move around, to sit, to stand, to receive some prayer. We love you, church, so much. It doesn't matter how many times we tell a story, how many different words we use. We can't change it. God has come to redeem us, and we must make room in our hearts for him. The family hiding from the storm found no place at the keeper's door. It was for this a child was born To save a world so cold and hollow A sleeping town they did not know That lying in a manger low A Savior King come to heal our sorrow. Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart for God to write his story? Shepherds counting sheep at night Do not fear the glory light You are precious in His sight God has come to raise the lowly Is there Every 